Okay, thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleague Peterson, it is a great honor and pleasure for me as a board member of the Oswald Spengler Society to introduce this year's Spengler Prize winner with a brief outline of his biographical background before David Amos and Max Otter will pay tribute to his academic work and public influence. Jordan Bernd Peterson was born in Edmonton, Alabama on the 12th of June, 1962. Sorry? In Alberta, Alberta, yeah. Uh, uh, on the 12th of June, 1962. He grew up in Fairview, a town of less than 3,000 inhabitants, some 350 miles northwest of, Fair, um, of Fairview, uh, of the provincial capital. So as the CV contained in one of his books puts it, he was raised and toughened in the frigid wastelands of northern Alberta. Peterson met Tammy Roberts in 1989. The couple have two have a daughter, Michaela, and a son, Julian. In the introduction to his first book, Maps of Meaning, Peterson vividly describes the conservative environment of his youth which should no doubt later become very important for the direction of his research. His father Walter was a school teacher and his mother Beverly worked as a librarian. Let me quote Jordan Peterson in order to give us an impression of the living conditions that determined his early outlook on society. He writes that he was raised under the protective auspices, so to speak, of the Christian church his family was merely traditionally Protestant and not explicitly religious, he writes. And then he continues, quote, nonetheless, no doubt, the historical remnants of Christian morality permeated our household. When I grew up, after all, most people still attended church. Furthermore, all the rules and expectations that made up middle-class society were Judeo-Christian in nature. Even the increasing number of those who could not tolerate formal ritual and belief, still implicitly accepted, still acted out the rules that made up the Christian game." End of the quote. After graduating from Fairview High School in 1979, Peterson studied political science, first at the Grand Prairie Regional College, I hope I pronounced it correctly, and then at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. It was his initial intention to become a lawyer because he had in the meantime rebelled against the Christian belief and developed sympathy for socialist theories. Concerned with large scale political and social issues like global poverty and injustice, totalitarian regimes and the Cold War, he wanted to know, quote, how did evil, particularly group fostered evil, come to play its role in the world, end of quote. But he was disappointed. In the discipline of, this, uh, of political science, he had the feeling that he could not learn more about the structure of human beliefs, which he considered so important for understanding politics. This is why he started to study psychology. And following his BA in political science, and after a year off to explore Europe and the Cold War, he additionally completed his BA in psychology in 1984. Subsequently, he moved to Montreal, where he earned his PhD in clinical psychology at McGill's University and stayed as a postdoctoral fellow at McGill's Douglas Hospital. From 1993 to 1998, he then worked at Harvard University, first as an assistant professor and later as an associate professor before he eventually became a full professor of psychology at the University of Toronto. I think it is important to know that Peterson practiced as a clinical psychologist beside his research and his teaching duties throughout most of his professional career, thus constantly being forced to check the academic theories in practice. It was during his time at Harvard that Jordan Peterson shifted his focus on interest and of interest towards questions of personality. His academic publication, publications on a wide range of topics like personality, meaning, creativity, and the role of social factors, religion, and ideology soon made him famous in his discipline. What made him well known to a broader public, including us, were his three books, 
Maps of Meaning, the Architecture of Belief, published in 1999, 12 Rules for Life, an Antidote to Chaos, published in 2018, and Beyond Order, 12 More Rules of Life for Life, published in 2021. In his first book, Maps of Meaning, Peterson starts with the observation that chaos and order are two fundamental elements of reality. He then tries to show how people find meaning in optimally balancing them. Let me give you a quote. He writes, the world can be validly construed as a forum for action as well as a place of things. We describe the world as a place of things using the formal method of science. The techniques of narrative, however, myth, literature, and drama portray the world as a forum for action. The domain of the former is the objective world. The domain of the latter is the world of value. The world as forum for action is composed essentially of three constitu constituent elements. First is unexplored territory, the great mother, nature, crea creative and destructive source and final resting place of all determinate things. Second is explored territory, the great father, culture, protective and tyrannical, cumulative ancestral wisdom. Third is the process that mediates between unexplored and explored territory, the divine son, the archetypal individual, creative exploratory word, and vengeful adversary. Unprotected exposure to unexplored territory proceed, produces fear. The individual is protected from such fear as a consequence of ritual imitation of the great father, as a consequence of the adoption of group identity, which restricts the meaning of things and confers predictability on social interactions. When identification with the group is made absolute, however, everything has to be controlled when the unknown is no longer allowed to exist, the creative exploratory process that updates the group can no longer manifest itself. Here we see, according to Peterson, how evil, particularly group-fostered evil, comes to play its role in the world. In the two books on rules for life, Peterson applies these theoretical and demanding insights to everyone's practical life by formulating rules for individual behavior, using a multitude of vivid episodes from his own clinical experience. Let me try to express the key message in my own words. Everybody, he says, should constantly strive to develop his or her own personality by curiously exploring the unexplored territory of the objective world supported and protected by the world of values provided by one's own culture and civilization, thereby trying to follow the example of the archetypal hero who can always be found near the border between the two worlds, struggling and fighting. Let me quote some of the rules. First from the first book of, on rules, stand up straight with your shoulders back. Treat yourself like someone you are responsible for helping. Make friends with people who want the best for you. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. Set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. And from the second, the newest book, do not carelessly denigrate social institutions or creative achievement. Abandon ideology. Do not allow yourself to become resentful, deceitful, or arrogant. Be grateful in spite of your suffering. Since 2003, after the publication of his first book, Peterson often appeared on television. And in 2013, he registered his own YouTube channel which currently has 5.3 million subscribers and 450 million total viewers. In this situation, considering the constantly growing number of his followers, Jordan Peterson could easily have added to his very successful academic life, a comfortable career as a popular media personality, but things came different. 
It was probably unavoidable, considering his, in the meantime, well-known view of reality, that he was publicly confronted with questions concerning the most obvious developments in society. Anybody else might have avoided the conflict with, let me say, a certain degree of caution and diplomacy. But Jordan Peterson is not the man to preach water and drink wine. Instead, referring to his principles, he entered into a lasting fight for free speech and against political correctness, identity politics, the gender ideology, and other attempts of those who are trying to control everything, claiming that proper culture has been undermined by postmodernism and new Marxism. Obviously, this brought him a lot of trouble. Besides problems with the social media in the form of an interruption of regular donations for his YouTube channel or the suspension of his Twitter account, the conflict around the Canadian Bill C-16 probably received most attention. The bill proposed to add gender identity or expression as a prohibited ground of discrimination under the Canadian Human Rights Act. Peterson criticized this act for its implications on free speech and earned himself severe criticism for, from transgender activists, faculty, and labor unions. Like the archetypal hero, he never retreated in any of these conflicts or even withdrew from the public. But no doubt for him and his family, the constant struggle was a severe burden. And so his wife, Tammy, his daughter, Michaela, and he, Jordan Peterson himself, have suffered under severe health problems in the past years. This is why in the fall of 2021, Peterson resigned from the employment of the University of Toronto, becoming Professor Emeritus. But luckily, he has recovered, as we have seen, and was able to resume his public presence. He is currently touring Europe in order to present his latest book. We are very happy to have him here today and we are able and to be able to award him the prize of the Oswald Spengler Society. Welcome and all the best to you and to your family, Jordan. Thank you. Thank you, Gerd. And I think without much further ado, we switch to Warsaw to Professor David Engels, who is uh, well known in Europe as a historian, as a Spengler scholar, as a public intellectual too, of the next generation almost, not quite, half a generation. So David, uh, we're kindly awaiting your words. And Egan. Yeah, sure. Ladies and gentlemen, dear Professor Peterson, from my hopefully satisfyingly cleaned up room in Warsaw, Poland, it is a great honor for me to pay tribute to this year's Oswald Spengler laureate, Jordan Peterson. And while my colleagues dwell on his biography and his anthropological approach, it is now my duty to analyze the historical philosophical dimension of his work. Let us first be very clear and honest with ourselves. Jordan B. Peterson is not an orthodox Spenglerian, at least not in the sense that his word work would be dominated by what is Spengler's best known contribution to the historical sciences, that is his morphological parallelizations of the various human civilizations. Of course, there are certainly numerous allusions to historical parallels in Peterson's work, since he understands, like no other psychologist alive today, how to bring the many different experiences of individual people into connection with each other and to synthesize them into collective uh, experiences of entire societies, while at the same time emphasizing the importance of collective imprinting for the behavior of the individual and being thoroughly convinced that the society is much more than the mere sum of its individual components. Higher statements in an age condemning all forms of essentialism. At the same time, Peterson also believes, and another exception these days, that history offers a store of experience that can still be of immediate use to us today, a view that can only really be sustained if one assumes that historical situations can resemble each other and are not completely singular or accidental. Finally, in Peterson's 12 Rules for Life in particular, one finds interesting reflections 
on the dynamics of every civilization. For example, when he uses the biblical history of the Jewish people to show how the Israelites increasingly developed from a state of closeness to God and social cohesion to one of greed for power, distance from God and social polarization, and had to pay very dearly for this. In a sense, the blueprint for the development of every civilization, ours explicitly included, as Peterson insists on. Nevertheless, these various insights are, of course, not genuinely Spenglerian, since they ultimately go back to Topoi that we can already trace back to the Old Testament that were also repeated and elaborated on again and again in classical antiquity, the Middle Ages, and even in the philosophy of history of modern times, as Spengler and Toynbee were also well aware of. They thought, in fact, incidentally, that in no way disavows the significance of those insights but rather quite the opposite underscores the profound truth perceived the new and reactualized in each different uh, generation. So what is really Spenglerian about Jordan Peterson's work? One has to delve a little bit deeper into the basic assumptions of Spengler and Peterson to be able to answer this question, but one will be rewarded with a wealth of meaningful parallels. Obviously, Peterson's razor sharp psychological critique of our own time should be mentioned first, as it coincides in many respects with the diagnosis that Spengler also developed, especially in the second volume of his Decline of the West. Peterson makes no secret of the fact that our present time is highly corrupted by population decline, mass migration, ultra liberalism, hedonism, political paralysis, big city life, aging societies, media dictatorship, social polarization, populism, and many others. And is given over to cultural decay, while the hope for a restitution of whatever status quo ante, perhaps even for some kind of renaissance of the West, is extremely slim, if not impossible. As Spengler, however, Peterson is by no means tempted to give in either to unrealistic dreams or to the complacency of a purely hedonistic or materialistic après moi le déluge, against which he is fighting repeatedly and with great persuasiveness. On the contrary, Peterson invites an unsparing recognition of this situation, the courage to face the inevitable and to stand firmly by truth and tradition despite our dire prospects a typically Spenglerian position, such as we find it expressed in the famous last lines of men and techniques. Similarly, for both Spengler and Peterson, it is not the false idols of contemporary wokeism that can guarantee the survival of our late civilization, but only loyalty to the treasures of experience accumulated by our ancestors over the century. A certain affinity for tradition which in Peterson's case, incidentally, is increasingly combined with a very positive valuation of Christianity. Admittedly, this increasing significance of Christianity in Jordan Peterson's work also reveals characteristic differences between him and Spengler. As a philosopher of life and a Nietzschean, Spengler could only appreciate the phenomenon of the religious and the surge from unconditional and also supratemporal transcendental truth from a formal, morphological, and aesthetic point of view. He could only grasp what was actually essential through the somewhat crude and pantheistic dualism between matter and life. Peterson, on the other hand, is both a step ahead and behind him in this respect. From the relativism and aestheticism of the 20th century, as it still characterized Spengler's work, he has taken up a new search for the absolute and the transcendent without which every civilization must disintegrate into nothingness. And this not only represents uh, the uh, morphological type of the second religiosity as predicted by Spengler, but uh, also actually transcendence the, uh, transcends the metaphysically unsatisfactory nature of a purely aestheticizing philosophy of life. But it is precisely in this respect also that Bert Peterson's most important mission is reflected which not coincidentally also connects him with Spenglers, namely that of an educator who tries to offer a new or rather old in the good sense, of course, certainly certainty to a restless and unsubstantial youth. 
Spengler saw himself, as uh, is already abundantly clear in the introduction to the decline of the West, not only as a historian, but also as an educator who wanted to offer new stability in a culturally increasingly disintegrating time and disoriented world. He was concerned on the basis of a pitiless enumeration of the many problems of the present at their roots in the morphological realities of history to outline what the challenges and problems of the new generations were and what possibilities were realistically still open to it. Peterson too strives for nothing less than to create a new morality for a late civilization. And in doing so, he addresses himself above all to a disoriented male youth, which on the one hand senses the numerous problems of the present, as well as of the prevailing leftist ideology, but at the same time is unable to create a positive and constructive counter image, because the chain of tradition that held the Occident together for centuries has often enough been interrupted. In this respect, Peterson is once again ahead of Spengler. And Spengler was still able to rely on a certain survival of Western or even Russian virtues in the Weimar period, even though these had been severely tested by the traumatism of the First World War and the experiences of the 1920s. Although Spengler foresaw what he called the felachization of the Western man, as well as the moral disintegration of our civilization, he at least had the hope that a small power elite would continue to defend at last, at least in essence, the thousand year old values of our civilization. True, he too spoke of the fight of the natural elite from the machine, predicted pacifism, ecologism and escapism, and expected increasing radicalization and dumping down of the road masses by highly politicized media. But he, who expected the fierce political competition between the most diverse power groups, at the same time expected a steady increase in the power of the West and prophesied Caesarism as the inevitable final stage of Western civilization before its petrification. And he would certainly be astonished by our actual present. Since instead of imperialism, we are experiencing globalism, and instead of intense political conflict, an increasingly ideological totalitarianism, combined not with rising cultural patriotism, but with relativism, multiculturalism, false tolerance, and civilizational decay. All aspects which are certainly compatible with Spengler's pessimistic morphological prediction, but which in retrospect still make them seem too optimistic. It is precisely at that point that Jordan Peterson sets in to help the youth, on whom Spengler had already placed his hopes, to understand their cultural identity in the first place, without which the fulfillment of their civilizing mission, as described by Spengler, was not even possible. Peterson is thus, in a sense, carrying out the laying of new moral foundations without which the implementation of Spengler's future program for the final steps of our civilization cannot even be conceived. Of course, for Peterson, this moral build-up is not only of a purely pragmatic and functional nature, but also contains a strong idealistic component, which not only has the efficiency of state and civilization in mind, as is the case with Spengler, but also takes into account the ethical importance of the individual. Here, too, Spengler and Peterson are on paths that are not mutually exclusive, but vary or vary in their uh, emphasis. Whereas Spengler's conception of man is inevitably shaped by the idea of the Nietzschean Übermensch and his elitist will mm. devour, Peterson starts from a typically Anglo Saxon ethical perspective and thus brings the individual into focus, not only as a genial or cynical cultural or political actor or as helpless human material, but as a unique creature that is to be admired, not only for its occasional cultural feats of brilliance, but also to be appreciated in its suffering and weaknesses.
In Spengler, this empathetic approach is largely absent, at least in his published work on the philosophy of history. And even in his autobiographical legacy, it can only be found in the form of Spengler's highly tragic self-analysis and self-criticism, a conflict which, of course, has generally not been used in research for a better understanding of Spengler, but rather with the purpose of disavowing him. One should have taken into account the old wisdom that it is precisely the blind who, in order to compensate for their weakness, sharpen other abilities, such as the sense of hearing, to an extreme. So that accordingly, the psychological tragedy of Spengler is not in conflict with his diagnosis of civilization, but rather enables him to become one of the most outstanding psychologists of civilization, who has described the respective cultural condition of our collective action like no other. Here too, we can find, sort of find points of convergence in the work of Jordan Peterson, who likewise places our manifold imprinting by tradition, family, nation, language, or culture at the center of his work, and does not draw from this observation as does the currently prevailing ideology, the appeal to the destruction of these seemingly constricting and allegedly oppressive structures, but quite the opposite. The statement that only within this framework, there can be any meaningful self-development of the human being, one of those insights that are also fundamental to the work of Oswald Spengler. On this basis alone, Peterson has already earned tremendous merits for his efforts to fight for the survival of our Western civilization, merits hardly inferior to those of Spengler for our understanding of human civilization. My sincere thanks and congratulations to you, Jordan Peterson. Thank you very much for accepting the 2022 Spengler Prize. On, in October 2016, Jordan Peterson almost instantly became a global phenomenon, a voice heard by millions, a moral authority to be listened to around the globe, a public intellectual, a source of inspiration to, and hope to countless men and women. The Wall Street Journal states that the startling success of his elevated arguments for the importance of order has made him the most significant conservative thinker to appear in the English-speaking world in a generation. We are proud and honored that Dr. Jordan Peterson accepted the 2022 Oswald Spengler Award and we awarded for his invaluable contribution to applied conservative philosophy grounded in scientific knowledge of the human species and human behavior, the humanities and mythology, and for bridging the gaps between those fields and for speaking out. The Oswald Spengler Prize is selectively awarded to personalities who make truly significant contributions of global relevance in the sciences, the arts, or social and political thought. It has so far been awarded only twice before to French historian, uh, to French writer Michel Ulbeck and to historian Walter Scheidel teaching in Stanford. The prize recipients and its namesake all share an important characteristic. They are aware of the biological, psychological, and sociobiological traits and limitations of our species and acknowledge them as a basis of their work. This creates a realistic, unideological, and I would say conservative approach. Great books, archetypes, dreams, myths, the origin of conflicts and prejudices and their rationalization, evolutionary biology, neuroscience. Jordan Peterson's work is in the very center of the Oswald Spengler Society's interests um, by exploring those fields and bridging the disciplines. It was actually very difficult to get Dr. Peterson. For almost a year, I tried every email address and other address I could find. Then I made a final attempt. I almost gave up, but never give up is, is uh, one of the teachings we get from Jordan Peterson. Then I made a final attempt through my publisher, who had also acquired the German rights to Beyond Order. And when our letter reached Dr. Peterson,
He immediately accepted the prize. No further questions, no safeguarding. Quite untypical for our times. This to me is a sign of a man safely established, a man sure of, of his judgment and position, the sign of an eminent man. We did have a meeting and a discussion months later in Tallinn, Estonia. Peterson had just lectured to an audience of 5,000 people the evening before. He was the same person I see in social media, open, curious, explaining, enjoying, exploring a real and enjoying a real discussion. On a side note, I'm happy to report that Michel Ulbeck and Walter Scheidel both also accepted right away without hesitation and discussion. With the gracious acceptance by Jordan Peterson, the Oswald Spengler Prize has established itself as the most important global award for realistic thought about humanity and humans. That is aside from the Nobel Prize, but that prize has a different focus. The Board of Directors of the Society, a society of individuals and academics solely devoted to the pursuit of truth, the study of humanity and world history, will do its utmost to protect the exceptional standards set by the first three prize recipients. It is well worth watching the video of Peterson's defense of free speech at the University of Toronto that propelled him into the center of the debate of many issues of today. Free speech, gender theory, cancel culture, self-responsibility, civil debate, freedom, and ultimately the question how to defend our values as enlightened and free societies. Peterson had set up a microphone and a small amplifier in front of the university building to talk about Bill C-16, a law adding gender identity or expression as a prohibited ground of discrimination. In other words, a law making gender language mandatory and its non-use a public offense. When some students disturb the speech and eventually disconnect the amplifier, Peterson continues with a strong voice against a loud backdrop of protesters and supporters, supporters too, to make his points. I quote, putting restrictions on free speech is something dangerous beyond comprehension. And that's what we're faced with. We have to be able to say what we are willing to say badly, or we won't be able to think at all. And I know where that leads. I've studied totalitarianism for four decades and I know how it starts. Strong words spoken with authority and deep conviction. But even if Jordan Peterson became an intellectual superstar overnight, his prominence is hard earned, rests on solid ground, and took a life of preparation, thinking, and learning. Up to the time of his fame, he had authored or co-authored more than 100 academic papers and had, by all measure, a truly exceptional and stellar academic record. His books, his first book and his later books, show the development of a mind, give insights into his thinking, and they allow us to share in his further intellectual journey, or rather his series of heroes' journeys, out of each of which the hero emerges shaken, having lost something, but transformed, refined, stronger. The last of these journeys was a serious and long-lasting illness that nearly led to our hero's death. We are relieved beyond expression that Dr. Peterson emerged from it a stronger man. Composing these remarks confronted me with unexpected difficulties, not for lack of material, but to the country because there's so many aspects to write. So in the rest of my speech, I will focus on three themes. First, some ideas, themes and areas of interest shared by Jordan Peters and Oswald Spengler. Second, very briefly, the meaning of conservative. And third, the problems and challenges of today, Spengler's predictions and Peterson's antidote. If some of what I may say does not make sense the first time you hear it, I can only encourage you to study and read Peterson and Spengler. If you've read Peterson and find some of the Spengler quotes resonant, go ahead and read Spengler. It can't hurt. And if you're Spenglerian and tended to view Peterson as a contemporary and temporary phenomenon, read Peterson. You will be surprised. On a side note, Oswald Spengler in his time too was a, regarded as a contemporary phenomenon. Quite a few colleagues begrudged him his fame. Still his thoughts continue to influence and inform us today. If I may venture a prediction, so will Dr. Peterson's, because they go deep, because they provide meaning, because they are what contemporary philosophy should be, interdisciplinary, deeply grounded, practical, and immensely relevant. So what are some of the common themes in Peterson's and Spengler's work? 
Here is Jordan Peterson, the academic and clinical psychologist with a stellar academic record at Trent Public Intellectual. There is Oswald Spengler, the private scholar with an MIA in biology and a doctorate in philosophy. Both became famous in their time, seemingly overnight, but in reality after a long time of thinking, research and reflection. As a psychologist, Peterson wants to understand and help people. What motivates us? How do our brains and emotions work? What makes us tick? This led him to branch out in very different directions, neuroscience, behavioral psychology, mythology and religion. Oswald Spengler too uses the word soul a lot. He wants to understand cultures, seeing them as individuals of higher order, each having its own life cycle, just as individuals have. From his understanding, Spengler also derives practical advice for our, or better, his times, as we've heard from David Engels. The Decline of the West is a work bristling with interdisciplinary and cross-cultural references, taking ancient wisdom seriously on its own terms. Indeed, Spengler was the first to overcome Eurocentrism in history and anthropology. Alas, today, he's labeled a rightist. Peterson and Spengler are both highly compassionate and sensitive thinkers. A few years ago, the diary entries of the young Spengler were published, giving insights into a tormented, sensitive soul. Peterson, in turn, faced his own demons. One also thinks of Friedrich Nietzsche. But maybe in addition to a brilliant mind, such sensitivity is needed to truly observe people in society, to put oneself into the mindset of another culture or into the mindset of a concentration camp guard, as Peterson wants us, wants us to do to think what made this possible. As, as Jordan Peterson relates, the understanding of the horrible events of the 20th century, two world wars, Hitler, Stalin, the Gulags, the Khmer Rouge, Rwanda and Burundi, was a major motivating force for his early work. Gerd Morgenthaler mentioned that Peterson distinguishes the world as a place of things and a forum for action. Spengler makes the very same distinction, but uses a different terminology. Nature for Spengler is a place of things. History, be it in its modern or in its earlier forms of mythology and religion, is the forum of meaning. Indeed, this dichotomy is central to understanding decline of the West, and many pairs of opposite terms refer to it, number and face, nature and history, taboo and totem, priesthood and nobility, truth, wahrheit, and facts, tatsachen. There are even references to something like the great father and the great mother in Spengler. What is missing is the great son. I'll give you three quotes and, uh, uh, and I'll then say who they were from. Quote one, I've been attempting to consider history itself as a unitary phenomenon as a single thing in one sense, in order to understand what it is and how it affects what I think and what I do. If you realize that history is in some sense in your head, and you also realize that you know nothing of the significance of history, of its meaning, which is certainly true, then you must realize that you know nothing of yourself and of your own meaning. I'm writing this, my book, in an attempt to explain the psychological significance of history, to explain the meaning of history. Quote two. Is there a logic of history? Is there beyond all the casual and incalculable elements of the separate events, something that we may call a metaphysical structure of historic humanity, something that is essentially independent of the outward forms, social, spiritual, and political, which we see so clearly? Does world history present to the seeing eye certain grand traits again and again with sufficient constancy to justify certain conclusions? And if so, what are the limits to which such reasoning might be pushed? In short, is all history founded upon general um, biographic archetypes? Quote three, all cultures, even those most disparate in nature, develop along broadly predictable lines and have within their mythological history certain constant features. End of quote three. I could quote many others. The initiated few will be able to assign them to their proper sources, but to most ears, they will sound remarkably similar. Quote one, John Peterson. Two, Oswald Spengler. Three, Peterson again. I could quote many more. 
To Peterson, the way in which we label, judge, and categorize our events, our worldview, our Weltanschauung, the automatic attribution of meaning to things is predetermined by our culture and has always been passed down from one person to another by means of art, music, and religion and tradition, and not by rational explanation. It is like translating from one language to another. That, of course, is one of Spengler's central tenets, that each culture has its own style that expresses itself in architecture, government, art, organization, and virtually all aspects of its life. If history provides meaning, as would religion and mythology, then it is there to form identity, to give order to social events, to grade an us versus a them. Throughout most of history, this has meant degrading the other, the unknown. It is by, not by coincidence that many early societies and tribes only call their own tribe humans and all others something else, that the Greeks and Romans labeled all others barbarians. This pernicious tendency leads to, in Peterson's words, the paradox at the bottom of human motivation for evil. People need their group identification, but the tendency to protect one's own can lead to hatred of the other and to war. So history is not the history of class conflicts, as Marx would have it, but the history of conflicts, period. Friedrich Nietzsche, who had a significant influence on both Jordan Peterson and Oswald Spengler, provided deep, if not only very systematic, insight into the relativity and functionality of morals. In doing so, one could argue that Nietzsche pioneered sociobiology by now a respected, if somewhat hidden, discipline. Contemporary pioneers of that discipline, like biologist Edward O. Wilson and sociologist Napoleon Chagnon, in the late 1970s were defamed, vilified, and nearly destroyed as biological reductionists by their leftist colleagues as early as the 1970s and 1980s. But piece by piece, empirical research has uncovered that we are being run and dominated by bi biological and behavioral programs to a much greater extent than even we thought possible just a few decades ag decades ago. One can make the point, and I think our laureate would, that only the knowledge of the programs running inside us enables us as humans to leave our predicaments behind and behind us and evolve in our thinking and behavior. Jordan Peterson knows that real thinking is hard and it's rare, that we have to look behind the facade of things to make sense of them. And Jordan Peterson has used that insight to push both our knowledge and to stand up for what we, men and women of the West, believed to be our values, our heritage, and the values that brought us to where we are today. So what makes a conservative? Jordan Peterson has been labeled a conservative thinker. He himself terms himself a classical liberal. I will name four and briefly discuss two of those aspects. First, respect for traditions and institutions. This is what most people would have in mind first. Jordan Peterson picks up that theme in rule number one in his recent book, Beyond Order. Second, knowledge of the weakness and volatility of most humans or their capacity for good and evil and the frailty of civilization. Most of us are pretty easily swayed to do terrible things given the right environment. So when thinking about Nazi, for, Nazi Germany, for example, instead of Oscar, uh, identifying with Oskar Schindler, Peterson urges you to put yourself into the shoes of a concentration camp guard. Third, an awareness that we as humans will inevitably face moral dilemmas in the course of our life. We can either ignore them, which is the road to hell or totalitarianism or face them. Edmund Burke, the first conservative thinker on this, the choices of men are often between differences of good in compromises, sometimes between good and evil, and sometimes between evil and evil. This knowledge lets conservatives accept limits, limits set by their life situation, their obligations, by tradition, by institutions. The sky is rarely the limit. Conservatives prefer to work at one problem at a time, starting with themselves, and they know that improvement is hard. I'm working on one problem right now, which Dr. Peterson inspired me to work on. I'm working on a full Windsor knot. I'm still working on it, so but <laughs> I, 
try to improve incrementally there. Of course, before, before, because conservatives know what humans can do, they are deeply distrustful of ideologies and grand schemes to improve society. They know that su such schemes can quickly turn into the roads to hell. Jordan Peterson has brilliantly lined out the psychology of ideologies. Ideologies want to improve society or others on a grand scale. They do not tolerate differing viewpoints. In their extreme form, they want to exterminate ideas or even people that do not conform to their ideology. Driving forces are bad and even evil sentiments, resentment and disgust. I learned a lot from Jordan Peterson's lecture on disgust. If you hate somebody, you at least acknowledge his or her existence as an enemy. If you are disgusted by something, you do not want to think about it at all and just want to do away with it. Conservatives know that we better start with ourselves if we want to improve something. The left today is constructivist. Everything to them is a social contract. Your sex, for example. If you want to change it, just change the entry in your ID card or have actual operations. In some countries, adolescents now have the right to do such operations even against the will of their parents. And it's being pushed in Germany too. Race is a construct. So are nation states. It's ironic that in a sense, conservatives are constructivists themselves. They know that human behavior can cover a wide range, that the human mind can be made to believe many things, that societies behave in many ways, and some of the outcomes can be horrible. But conservatives are realists. They know that quite a few things are not constructs, but observable facts of life. Peterson mentions Price's law as such a fact of life. There are numerous others. The difference in play of girls and boys, um, the life rhythms and motivations of men and women, on average, that significantly accept their career and life choices. The famous lobster example at the beginning of 12 Rules for Life is a brilliant exposition of the pervasiveness and persistence of hierarchies in animal, but equally in human life. Dominance hierarchies, about which Peterson speaks a lot, are present everywhere. And if we don't see them, it is because we haven't, we have willingly closed our eyes. Spengler often mentions the naked facts of life that can't be ignored, either by politicians or philosophers. One of those facts is that the more developed states, even that is a word that we shouldn't say today, but I do, the more developed states and societies become, the more differentiated their hierarchies and social orders are. Spengler in 1919, among all the people of Western Europe, these two, the English and the Prussian German, are uh, one are dis is distinguished by a rigid social hierarchy. It puts every individual in the pre precise location in which he is needed most. Centuries are required for the clarification and realization of this special feeling for social structure. The English people is structured along a lines of wealth and poverty, the Prussian along lines of command and obedience. It is important to note that liberalism, gone overboard, is an ideolo ide ideology itself. Jordan Peterson describes himself as a classical liberal. Classical liberals, as well as conservatives, are well aware that a market economy, the market itself, needs moral foundations. The market is not the moral, it needs for moral foundations. Adam Smith wrote extensively about this in his theory of moral sentiments. This is why libertarianism, in my opinion, contains all the dangers of a potential ideology. The market is not an absolute moral principle. There are markets and hierarchies, and both have their le legitimate functions in social and economic life. Let me come to my last section. Spengler's predictions and Peterson's antidotes. When we look at the state of the West, it, it can only be described as dismal. David Engels mentioned some of the points. Free speech is being censored, and not so gently for that anymore. Freedom itself is at stake. Free movement has been severely restricted to the, during the COVID episode. The surveillance state is on the rise. Education is on the decline. A totalitarian ideology focuses on re-engineering climate and ultimately re-engineering humanity is on the rise. 
When we met, Dr. Peterson asked me how Spengler's predictions were holding up. Uh, I quote on this Joseph Campbell, a lifelong Oswald Spengler fan and a mythologist, who said as early as 1970, well, I can tell you it has been something of a life experience to have watched the not so gradual coming to fulfillment in this world of every bit of what Spengler promised. One of those dire predictions is that the age of democracy in all cultures lasting for about 200 years will end sometimes between 2000 and 2050 in a development analogous to the end of the Roman Republic. Along with this will come the end of universal conscription and the rise of professional armies around the year 2000. I quote Spengler, in the period of contending states, torrents of blood have reddened the pavements of all world cities so that the great truths of democracy might be turned into actualities and for the winning of rights without which life seemed not to be worth living. Now these rights are won, but the grandchildren cannot be moved even by punishment to make use of them. A hundred years more, and even the historians will no longer understand the old controversies. Another prediction, the final empire of the West will be dominated by a single center, a totalitarian structure organized along a single principle, in one sense, Peterson's tyrannical father. For Spengler, the question was whether this principle would be English, the total freedom of the individual, of unrestricted private property, a civil society without a state, or Prussian, a dominant state regulating all aspects of life. It is a fight between, thus Spengler, two systems of social, social stratification, one that is based on wealth and the uninhibited struggle for success, and one that is founded on authority and legislation. There can be no reconciliation. Neither of these principles can accept restriction of its will, and neither can be satisfied until the whole world has succumbed to its particular idea. This was written in 1919. Spengler asks further whether those who command the coming empire will be billionaires or universal administrators. As for the billionaire, Spengler again, the billionaire demands absolute freedom to arrange world affairs by, by his private decisions with no other ethical standard than success. He beats down armies with credit and speculation as his weapons. His state and his army are his trust, and the political state is little more than an agent he commissions with wars and with treaties and negotiations. Those words written in 1919 have an eerie ring today. When all questions have been debated, Spengler sees our culture sink into a second religiousness. The rise of Islam and radical sex is one sign of this, and the climate and gender cults have taken on religious forms too and shaped the belief systems of much of the younger generation. It could well be that the last religion of the West will be transhumanism, which is on the surface an anti-religious movement. When we dig deeper, however, we can see many aspects that constitute the perverted religious belief system. I would have loved to see Jordan Peterson and Oswald Spengler discuss religion and the state of religion. Both have thought deeply about it in relation to what it means to humans and our culture. Both would have had much common ground and hopefully quite a few fruitful disagreements. Spengler predicted more. He pointed to moral decadence, was the first to see environmental degradation as a large-scale problem in men and techniques, and in the, in the 1920s considered the rise of a second caliphate in the Orient, when suddenly no one questions the authority of the caliph anymore. It is worth remembering that at the time the Islamic world was a beaten down backwater hardly worth mentioning. There are, according to Oswald Spengler, dark times ahead. So my very final words and section, what are Jordan Peterson's antidotes for the time to, times to come? I will only point towards three of his many helpful medicines and add one suggestion of my own. One is confront the unknown and stay adaptive. Explaining rule number nine, assume that the person you are listening to might know something you don't, Peterson states that what we don't know is much more important than what we do know. Humans have a tendency to stay with the known. It is much more convenient, but it is dangerous 
to not face the unknown. We simply don't know what's coming. And even if Spengler gives us some ideas, this still does not provide us with a course of action. So let us remain alert and let us try to be adaptive. Two, pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. I will refrain from rephrasing the chapter dealing with this rule number seven. It is brilliant, full of wisdom and surprising insight as are the other chapters of the book. If, if you haven't done so yet, do read 12 Rules for Life. The pursuit of meaning essentially makes us human. Therefore, to Peterson, the pursuit of happiness is a pointless goal. Or in Oswald Spengler's words, no one living in any part of the world today will be happy, but many will be able to control by the exercise of their own will the greatness or insignificance of their life course. In the pursuit of meaning, we have to give up something to make sacrifices. I've watched Jordan Peterson take an increasingly open stance on political issues in addition to gender theory and wokeism, the COVID pandemic, even the Ukraine war. Dr. Peterson, you are risking a lot for the sake of all of us. Who knows what further actions those in power will conceive in their inevitable attempts to put you down. No, Dr. Peterson, you haven't changed. You've applied your thinking to more of the problems of today. We profoundly thank you for that. We also thank your wife for rendering her support to your mission. Third, cherish and maintain traditions. Conservatives know that institutions are there for reason, that they are the result of a complex process in which societies grapple for solutions. Do not carelessly denigrate social institutions or creative achievement is rule number one in beyond order. I would go a step further. Cherish, foster and participate in traditions. Many institutions of civil society have disappeared. Others have nearly been destroyed by the internet or the COVID pandemic. Seek out institutions you can identify with and participate. One, one tradition that comes at a low economic price is great literature. Jordan Peterson is well versed in the classics. Most colleagues, colleges have taken the classics class off the curriculum. But nothing prevents you from reading those books. There's great comfort in reading Marcus Aurelius and realizing that two millennia ago, this man grappled with many of the questions we are faced with today, even coming up with some pretty good answers. I'm watching with horror our books are being edited, some even withdrawn. Establish a physical library before it is too late. It may help you to get through some rough times. Three, look for unexpected beauty when you encounter it and be grateful in spite of, in spite of your suffering. 12 rules for life and beyond order close with a similar theme. There's beauty to be found even in bad times, and there are things to be grateful for, even in misery. Look out and create your own beauty. Peterson encourages us to pet a cat on the street when we encounter one. And uh, he adds, if you want to rather pet a dog, that's okay too. You can also, of course, build your own furniture, as Dr. Peterson does, or grow your own vegetables, as I do, or have your, have your um, do whatever uh, helps you in the pursuit of beauty and create that oasis of, of, of thought and beauty. Let me add one more suggestion. And this is not from Jordan Peterson, but from Friedrich August von Hayek, whom I don't agree with on quite a few things, because, uh, well, whatever. In The Road to Serfdom, Friedrich August von Hayek in 1944 describes his great lucidity how societies slide into totalitarianism. One thing that totalitarian states and societies don't like at all is, being, is activities being conducted for their own sake. In communist states, a communist physics or music or ethics for that purpose is being called for. The same is true for national socialism or, I'm afraid, for the new ideologies of our times, wokeism and transhumanism. They all want to serve science, art, and every aspect of life their own purpose. This is wrong. So let us do things for their own sake. 
pursue truth and seek beauty, appreciate great works of art. Do things for their own sake. In the, is a, doing things for their own sake is a sign of a truly independent person. It is also a powerful antidote to totalitarianism, though not without risk. What makes Dr. Peterson's antidote so powerful is that they connect us with the eternal questions of humanity to create a potent mixture that can indeed strengthen us for the things to come. And there are things to come. I think those in the room here know this, and quite a few of us know this. We see the forces of division at work when we look around. Indeed, in nothing is the power of the Dark Lord more clearly shown than in the estrangement that divides all those who still oppose him, says the elf Haldir in The Lord of the Rings. Jordan Peterson provides a voice and an example for all those who still oppose the Dark Forces. He has become a crystallizing force for those to see and want to stop the madness. As long as the times still allow for Jordan Peterson to emerge and to persist, not all is lost. In an article in the Harvard Business Re Review in 1977, Abraham Zelesnik asked the question, uh, what makes managers and what makes leaders? His conclusions, managers manage, leaders search for and provide meaning. Jordan Peterson goes a step beyond that. He helps others to search for meaning, and in doing so, he's more than a leader. He's a leader's coach and a leader's leader. Dr. Peterson, you have enriched our lives in difficult times. You're a shining light because you know what darkness is. You stand in the best tradition of the enlightened West. You've been a sole courageous voice in an ocean of unreason. You have given hope to innumerable people. We applaud you, we stand behind you, and we vest our hopes in you. May the Lord give you and your family strength and protect you. As a tribute to your invaluable contributions and as a sign of our appreciation and respect, we present you with the 2022 Oswald Spengler Award. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you well. Okay. Well, it's very difficult to sit here and hear so many positive things about myself, I'm afraid. But I appreciate that, and I appreciate the depth of, of, the, of the comments as well, and the care that you've taken in making them, and the fact of the award, and all the trouble that you put into making this event occur, and uh, making sure that I was part of it. And I also appreciate the fact that we could arrange this virtually, although it would have been better for all of us had I been there in person. Um, I guess I should make some remarks as a consequence of that that uh, intense introduction. And how long would you like me to speak? How, how long would that be appropriate? Well, if you can do 15 minutes, that'd be great, but... Uh... Um, yes, yes. Well, I don't know if I've ever only spoken for 15 minutes. No, we, we'd, love you, we'd love you to speak more. <laughs> please, please go ahead. We okay, are here. Okay. okay, well, I guess I might start with some comments. I'll start with some comments about what was brought up in the uh, introduction. I'll start, I think, first of all, with a discussion about the state of my political belief, let's say. If it is a political belief, I think it's more a metaphysical belief, but it has political implications. So I've been thinking through the dichotomy between liberal and conservative, partly on the temperamental front, because I understand that, that there are different inbuilt temperamental predispositions that tilt us towards a more conservative or more liberal stance. And I would say temperamentally, in some ways, I'm more on the liberal end of the distribution because I'm high in trait known as openness, which is a creativity dimension. And creative people like 
uh, untrammeled information flow and tend to think quite disparately and in a more visionary manner. The price that you pay for that is false positives. Creative people can be in error radically with their perceptions of patterns and their determination of potential future paths. And so as you're more expansive in your thinking, the probability that you might be radically right increases to this correct, I mean, but the probability that you'll be radically wrong also increases. And so that's the cost. Um, I am also a rather conscientious person, orderly and industrious, and that's a more conservative trait. And so I, I straddle uh, the uncomfortable divide between the two patterns of belief. But then I would say, philosophically, I've probably become more explicitly conservative in, la in later years. And that's complex, partly because my belief that I was fundamentally liberal in my thought was allied with the notion that I believe that the individual is the proper level of analysis, uh, politically and philosophically, theologically, ethically, all of that. Um, I believe, along with Kierkegaard, let's say that redemption is a, is a matter of individual striving. And I am a psychologist, say, rather than a sociologist or a political scientist or an economist. And so even in my choice of profession, when push came to shove, I focused on the individual rather than on the group. But I have come to understand in recent years more explicitly, I would say particularly under the influence of psychologists such as Jean Piaget, perhaps more than any others, but also more biologically oriented thinkers such as Franz de Waal and Jacques Pankstep that are, that there's a liberal and Protestant strain of psychological thinking that actually predicated on somewhat of the misapprehension. And I think it expresses itself to some degree in our current culture-wide confusion about the nature of identity. And so if you read the humanists of the 1960s, like Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers to some degree, although I think Maslow was more guilty of this than Rogers, you would get the impression, and you get this in some sense from the psychoanalysts as well, that sanity is a matter of individual self-actualization and expression. And it's best conceptualized as something that's fundamentally personal in nature. And so you could be, if you're, a, uh, if you're, if you're optimally functioning on a psychological level, it means that you actualize something that's intrinsic to you as a subjective being. And so even for Freud, who wasn't, uh, a 1960s humanist, let's say, sanity is something like the proper internal balance of three internal forces, ego, superego, and id. And even for Jung, psych, who is a broader thinker than Freud and a deeper thinker, sanity is still something like the harmonious interplay of intrapsychic forces. And you certainly see that with the existential psychologists of the 1950s and more particularly even with the existential or the humanist psychologists of the 1960s. So psychological health is construed as something that manifests itself most particularly at the level of the individual. And I would say in some ways I believe that and that probably shaped my choice of psychology as the science of, and practice of choice for me. But I've come to understand more explicitly, more recently, that that perspective is lacking. And it's lacking in some ways the same way that the notion that the free market can exist independently as a moral agent outside an underlying metaphysical and ethical substrate, because I don't think it can. Uh, that's apropos to the comments that were made in the introduction. It, the proper operation of the free market and the free society for that matter, presupposes an underlying ethos that's more fundamental than, than either the free individual or the free market. And then the question starts to become, well, what is that underlying ethos? And I think that um, a number of lines, a number of disciplinary lines of investigation on converging on a very similar answer. And the answer has something to do with the inevitable, inevitable emergence of a ethos of social responsibility 
as a consequence of the necessity of maintaining progressing iterative social interactions. So imagine that and this is also a failure of classic economics and its theories of man. So classic economists presume that human beings are self-interested actors. And they also implicitly define self-interested in a narrow manner that's predicated on the assumption of a certain kind of hedonism, a narrow hedonism. And so, so we maximize our self-interest. But the question is, well, what exactly is self-interest? And that's where things move from the liberal domain, I would say, in some fundamental way, to the conservative domain. So, there's a self that you could bind in a moment. And I would say that's the self that would be after immediate hedonic gratification. And you see that manifest itself most particularly, let's say, in the case of addictive behaviors, where the motivational impetus is to maximize positive emotion and reduce negative emotion, but in the moment. And so people are tempted towards the use, let's say, of, of amphetamine-like substances like cocaine and obviously amphetamines that do increase positive emotion or tempted towards use of sedative agents that decrease negative emotion. And speaking only as an advocate of hedonistic self-interest, you might say, well, why not? And the answer is, well, you pay for it later. And so what that means in some sense is that we need a more expanded version of what constitutes self-interest than the narrow self-interest of the moment. Because if you're acting properly in relationship to yourself, you act in a manner that works now that doesn't compromise you in an hour or in a day or in a week or in a year or maybe in 10 years, or maybe in 40 years, or maybe even throughout the life of your children. And because human beings are self-conscious and aware of the future, we do have a proclivity to take the self that's iterated across time into account when we're making what would otherwise be momentary and impulsive hedonic decisions. We know that people gripped by positive emotion, for example, are much more likely to be impulsive. And so that's the danger of happiness and like the technical danger of happiness and positive emotion. And I do think that the voice of conscientiousness is in large part the sense of the violation of the iterated versions of the future selves that unfold across time. And what that means on the conservative side is that even when we're acting in terms of our individual self-interest, if we're doing that in a mature manner, then we have to treat our personal selves as a community of variegated individuals, different individuals that we will become, uh, in some sense, a say in what we're doing right now. And so the answer there is, well, don't do something today for which you're going to pay for direly tomorrow. And then we might also extend that, and I think this is directly analogous to the fact that, well, and, and this, this bears directly on issues of identity, but we'll go there later. I want to take myself into account, but then I'm married. And so then the question immediately emerges, just exactly how much of myself is my wife? And the answer is, well, if it's a true marriage, then a lot, a lot. At minimum, even phenomenologically, the quality of my interactions with her are going to make up a lot of the experiences that I deem as my experience. And so it's very difficult to say in what way she isn't me. And I can certainly say that if you want to have a good marriage, you better bloody well treat your, life, your wife as if she's an extension of you and an autonomous and equally valuable extension. And I don't mean in some metaphorical sense. I mean in some practical, continually iterative sense, because it'll just be hell for both of you if that's not the case. And then the two of you, husband and wife, let's say, you're going to be embedded in a family, either with your mutual parents or with your children or both. And then a harmonious relationship between you as an individual and your wife and you as a couple and your family as a unit, that also be, has to be established. And I think you can think about that musically in some sense. If all of those elements 
at those different levels of hierarchical arrangement are organized properly, then there'll be a harmonious union that emerges out of that. And if you abide by that harmonious union, then you exist in some sense in this state of productive peace and grace. And then that family unit has to be nested inside the local community and then inside the town and then inside the state and then inside the country and then to some degree inside the international order and then to some degree within the potentially fatal embrace of the natural world itself. And understanding that nested embeddedment of the individual in those superordinate categories gives you a theory of sanity that's something more like the harmonious function of every single one of those social interactions at every single level simultaneously. And that's a much better definition of sanity. And I also think that sanity in the absence of that nesting is actually not possible. I don't know anyone who can be sane or certainly not maintain sanity without the constant feedback about who they are and what they're doing from agents in some sense outside of themselves nested at all of those levels of order simultaneously. And so I've thought for a while too that we do, that one of the things that parents do for children is help them become socially acceptable enough so that their peers will accept them as playmates. We know perfectly well that that's a cardinal goal of early socialization. You, you want to make your children maximally socially acceptable, desirable, let's say, by the age of four. And if you fail, the consequences are exceptionally dire for your child and irremediable by all known techniques. That's, this, that's the clinical situation. And part of the reason you want to make your child socially desirable is because if your child is in constant interaction with the others that surround him or her in this hierarchical manner, they can outsource the problem of maintaining sanity and psychological integration to the world. Imagine, imagine that, uh, you know, you have some character flaws, which shouldn't be that difficult to imagine. And then imagine that you're with friends and they're real friends. And then imagine that you tell a joke and the joke falls flat for, for reasons of delivery or, or lack of taste. And then imagine that your friends give you a bit of a rough time about that. And that's a reminder from them that you've transgressed the social boundary. And people are sending messages of transgression and, uh, what would you say, and abiding by the appropriate or desirable social norms. They're sending messages about that to each other all the time. If every word, with every facial gesture, with every nonverbal interaction, you're being reminded by the people you're fortunate enough to be associated with how you would conduct yourself if you were an optimally admirable individual. And that it's paying attention to those signals that basically constitute sanity itself, as far as I can tell, rather than it being merely the consequence of an optimally arranged pattern of intrapsychic sub entities, let's say, or being a consequence of something like mere humanistic self actualization in the face of external superego and tyranny. And so understanding that, and I, I think that's, I think that's an indisputable truth because the biologists who are studying the construction of animal hierarchies have come to exactly the same conclusion. I think it's an undeniable truth. That's tilted me in a more explicitly conservative direction because if sanity itself is a consequence of the optimization of functional embeddedness within a traditionally defined hierarchy, then sanity itself is dependent on the maintenance of something, maintenance of something like conservative tradition. And now that doesn't exhaust sanity in some sense, right? Because first of all, the social order can become warped and tyrannical. And now and then you have to take a stand against it. And we should also point out that there is great utility in transformative creative endeavor, but even making those allowances, which are crucially important, doesn't eradicate the fact that the fundamental foundation of, of proper psychological integration looks highly social and is dependent on the proper hierarchical arrangement and the proper 
complex function of social arrangements at multiple levels of analysis simultaneously. So that's definitely tilted me more towards a explicit conservative philosophy. No sanity without, pos- without uh, proper social function. It doesn't look like it's even possible. Partly, I would say, too, because it's too complex to regulate yourself, right? You don't have exhaustive self-knowledge. You're too complex to know yourself thoroughly. And so you have to outsource the problem of maintaining the delicate balance of your own complexity to multiple social actors and bring many, many different brains to bear on the problem. And so this is partly why teenagers are obsessed with fitting in. You know, their job, when they're young, they're dependent and they can rely on their parents to intermediate between them and the social world. When they start to escape that, they're not yet capable of being the more autonomous individuals they will be as full adults. And what they do is outsource the problem of who they should be and how they should act to their peer group. And, you know, that produces some of the pathologies of teenagehood. You say, well, if if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you jump off too? And the answer that most teenagers would give, if they were honest, is, yeah, I jump off the bridge right away because my friends would torture me to death if I was too cowardly to do so. And the proper parent would likely say, well, I can understand why you would do that because your fundamental goal is, in fact, to shape yourself into someone who can play by the rules of your peer group. But you have to remember that there's something beyond that as well. And that would be that contribution of individual creativity and integrity back to the group that we discussed earlier. And so I think that's what situates me, situates me more comprehensively and more explicitly on the conservative front. And then I would say there's one other element too that's probably relevant, and that has to do with a deep understanding that I've developed, at least deep for me, on behalf of the role that religious traditions play. And so I'm going to walk through that very briefly, and then maybe I'll bring these remarks to a halt. So I have come to understand more comprehensively since I wrote Maps of Meaning that not only do we view the world through the lens of a story, but that that is inevitable, that there is no other way of viewing the world except through the lens of a story. And then I would say further that what we call a story is actually the verbal description of a lens through which the world may be viewed. And the reason that we value stories and the reason that they're attractive to us is because knowing how to look at the world is so valuable that we have an instinct that directs us towards being gripped by any representation of such a lens. And then this has to do with the issue of whether the world is a form for action or a place of things. And I would say we even see the place of things through a description of the form for action. And so values actually prior to perception. And I also think the cognitive science, the most advanced cognitive science, points in that direction, and also it points in that direction unhesitatingly. Because an an emergent problem has developed. Partly it drove postmodernism. The emergent problem is that any set of potential perceptual phenomena is so complex that it looks irreducible. And so whenever you look at the world, and I mean at any given visual scene, or auditory scene for that matter, you're faced with the problem of an almost infinite multiplicity of possibility. And so the question is, well, how do you focus your attention? And that is really the question, because without focusing your attention, you cannot see the world. You can't even get to the empirical phenomena. And the answer is, you perceive the world through a hierarchy of attentional prioritization, which means that you look at one thing and not all the other things you can look at. And then you might say, well, what do you look at? And the answer is, you look at the thing that you calculate to be the most important thing that you should look at at that moment. And most important means most valuable. And then you might say, well, how do you make that determination? And that brings us back to the investigation of a hierarchy again. You know, you might say, um, well, why are we all gathered together in this room? And the answer is, well, because we're involved in uh, uh, an award ceremony. And why are we giving an award? Well, because we want to uh, 
we want to signify the existence of a certain pattern of action. And we might say, well, why do we want to signify that pattern of action? We might say, well, we found it admirable. And then we might say, well, why did we find it admirable? And we could say, well, it partakes of the class of admirable actions. And then we could say, well, what is that class? We could say, well, it's part of the encounter between what is known and what is unknown, the, 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 the courageous investigation of the frontier. And then we might say, well, why would we bother with that? And the answer is, well, that's how we establish and update our knowledge. And we do that because we want to live in the most fundamental and productive possible manner. And then we can say, well, that's all encapsulated inside something like the notion of the logos. And that's quite the damn story. And that is the fundamental story. And I've become almost completely convinced now that not only is that the fundamental story, but it has to be the fundamental story. And that the religious stories that undergird our culture are in some sense so true that they constitute the fundamental precondition for truth itself. I'm writing a book now called We Who Wrestle With God, and it's a, and you might say, well, what's the fundamental reality? You might question, what's the fundamental reality? Because you could say, well, it's a description of things and not a, uh, a map for action and perception. But I don't think that's true because a description of things cannot tell you how to act. That's the famous is ought problem. And that's partly because you can derive a very large number of potential pathways from any description of a given situation. So you can't follow the science because the science does not give you a direction. It gives you some hints as to what a potential useful direction might be assuming certain values, but there's no unerring guide from the description to the action. And so then the question is, well, what's the unerring guide to action? And I would say that's fundamentally derived from tradition. And one of the things I've started to understand about the, biblical corpus is that it's a a sequence of characterizations of the nature of the spirit that unites us psychologically as individuals but also socially as communities and so i'll just walk you through a bit of that give you a flavor of it so for example god in the opening chapters of the opening sentences of verses of genesis is presented as the source of order that uses something like the logos to extract order out of possibility. And then that's a model for the image in which men, men and women are made. And I think that's exactly right, because I think we are creatures who confront the horizon of possibility and transform it into order. And I think we can do that ethically, in which case the order we extract is good, or we can do it unethically, in which case the order we construct is bad. And I see that as a fundamental truth. We're, we're creatures who wrestle with the indeterminate horizon of possibility that constitutes the future. We are not deterministic machines. In fact, first of all, we can't be because the universe is not deterministic. And because the universe is not deterministic, the horizon of the future is unpredictable and no algorithm can compute it. And so we're not automaton robots, period. And the science says that, I would say, beyond a shadow of a doubt. And so that's the first characterization of, of the divine spirit that should be imitated. And the next characterization or later characterization is uh, God is the spirit that you walk with if you walk unselfconsciously in the garden. And that's that, that happens after Adam and Eve eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And are banished from the garden. God asks Adam to walk with him, and Adam won't. And Adam won't walk with God because he's self-conscious. That's basically what he says, that Eve has given him a fruit that's made him aware of his own nakedness, and now he can no longer walk with God. And so you say, well, what does that mean? It's, well, you know what it's like if you're doing something worthwhile in a beautiful and, and relatively secure and safe place, and you're not self-conscious, is that you're imbued with the spirit of engrossment in the nature of being and that might be momentary and transitory but you you certainly enjoy it and you certainly regard it as a pinnacle experience and you might do everything you can to make that experience happen over and over if you have enough courage and then in the story of Cain and Abel God is the spirit that calls us to proper sacrifice and holds us accountable if we 
fail in that task. And I think that's more or less self-evident that, that that's a high level spirit that does that, you know, and it's also something that's independent of us because this is something that Dostoevsky explored famously in Crime and Punishment is you can break the moral code. And this is where Nietzsche was wrong. You can break the moral code, but you will hold yourself accountable or more to the point, something within you that's outside of you and transcendent will absolutely hold you to account. And I think that's an undeniable fact of human experience. And we don't know what that spirit is, but we certainly know that it, it, it bears, a, it exerts a great influence on us. And then in the story of Noah, God is construed as the spirit that calls the wise and just to prepare in the face of intuitive catastrophe. And is that not a spirit you would follow? Is that not a spirit you would believe in? I mean, and is that not a spirit whose possession of someone else would cause you to, at least in some probability, admire that person? I think the answer to all that is yes. You know, if you know someone wise and just, who's becoming concerned about an impending disaster, and who is taking steps to forestall it, then the probability that you will imitate that person is very high. And that's the imitation of this abstracted divine spirit. And in the story of Abraham, God is the spirit that calls human beings out of their safe household, let's say, safe nation for that matter, safe complacency into the world of adventure. And that's, and Abraham has quite an adventure. It's, it's certainly not the simple pursuit of happiness or security in any sense of the word. And then I'll, I'll give you two more examples and then close this part of it. So there's uh, another later, a bunch of stories, but later in, in part of the narrative of Exodus, it's actually in numbers, but the Israelites are wandering through the desert. What does that mean? Well, imagine you're in a tyranny, and we're all in a tyranny to some degree. Sometimes it's the prison of our own imagination. And you might say, well, what stops us from breaking the bounds of tyranny? Because why subject yourself to tyranny? And the answer might be, well, if you drop your sterile presuppositions, you don't go to the promised land, you go to the desert. So that, 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 that too explicit certainty when disrupted doesn't produce redemption, it produces radical doubt. And so you end up somewhere outside the tyranny that's just as bad as the tyranny, but it's a mirror image, and that would be the desert. And so that's what happens to the Israelites. And they're wandering around in the desert, and they're getting pretty desperate because it's been a long time. And they don't know which way's up, and they don't know which way's down, and they lose faith. And so God is not very happy that they lose faith, and he sends in a bunch of poisonous snakes to, to bite them which seems a little harsh on God's side, but he seems to have a thing for disruptive snakes. And so he does it anyways. And they're biting the Israelites to the point of destruction and distraction. And so the Israelites all get together and they decide that they should probably return their allegiance to God. And they go see Moses and they say, you know, could you have a chat with God since you seem so close with him? And maybe you could get him to call off the damn snakes. And so Moses speaks to God and then the story takes a very weird twist because it would even make sense as a story if God softened his heart and repented and got rid of the snakes, which he produced. But that isn't what happens. He tells Moses to cast a serpent in bronze and to erect it on a staff and to place the serpent on the staff in the ground. It's an echo of the serpent in, and the tree of life. In any case, or it's an echo of the staff of Moses that transforms into a serpent because that's part of what happens during the plague. In any case, you put down the, the staff of bronze with the serpent on it, and then you get, you get the Israelites. He says, bring the Israelites over and have them look at the snake gaze upon the snake. And if they do that, well, the snakes will still be there, but if they bite them, they won't die. And that's a very weird story eh? because the simple thing to happen from a narrative perspective is that God just chases away the snakes. And the fact that he gets the Israelites to go look at these 
wrong snakes is that's very mysterious but i but i know the key to it at least in part you know one of the things clinical psychologists have learned in the last hundred years across the fields of clinical psychology all the different subdisciplines is that if you expose people voluntarily to the things that hurt and frighten them they get braver they don't get less anxious they get braver and that generalizes so if you expose someone for example who's terrified of elevators who has agoraphobia and they learn to re-inhabit the elevator it's often women they'll often go have a fight with their husband and they might have been afraid to do that for 20 years but they get braver because they've confronted the cat catastrophe of potential humiliating death inside the elevator they find out they can tolerate it and then they have a much more they're they have a much more courageous orientation towards life and that's a fundamental clinical dictum exposure to that which frightens you into avoidance if it's voluntary is curative and that's the key issue in that story that story of moses and that's really something that's a that's a that's a near literary miracle but there's something on top so that's another aspect of god god might be he who sends the snakes but god is also the spirit that will inhabit you if you courageously confront the snakes that assault you and that's something to know and then you get a transformation of that in the in the in the uh gospels because christ assimilates himself to the serpent on the stake and he says something like unless i'm lifted up like the serpent in the desert and unless you lift me up like the serpent in the desert was lifted up there will be no entry into the kingdom of heaven it's something like that and that's a very weird thing for anyone to say especially given that the references to a story that's almost completely opaque that was written maybe at least 2500 years before and so that really begs an explanation, right? That's either something random and inexplicable and bordering on insanity, or it means something so damn deep, it's almost impossible to penetrate. And it's the latter that's true. And I think I figured out at least in part why. And so imagine that it is the case that voluntary exposure to that which petrifies you is curative. And I think, as I said, the evidence for that that's actually the mechanism of learning itself, right? Because when you encourage children to push themselves beyond their current horizon, they do have to encounter something they're made timid by and overcome it. And that process of adaptable overcoming is the process of learning. So the fact that voluntary exposure to the frightening and unknown is curative is actually a definition of the process of adaptation itself. And then you might say, well, how radical does that have to be in order to be optimally successful? And I would say that's what Christianity has been attempting to explicate for 2,000 years. And so the notion would be, if you think about the passion story, the passion story is in some sense the sum of all possible snakes. Because it involves, Jung described, Carl Jung described it, the passion story as an archetypal tragedy, the archetypal tragedy. And the reason it was archetypal in some sense is because it represented a limit case. There may be, it may be possible to formulate equally tragic stories, but it's not possible to formulate one that's more tragic. So it's, it's the essence of tragedy itself. And you might ask why, and I can give you a few, I can give you a few hints as to that well first this the core of tragedy is undeserved suffering let's say and then what you have to do to make it archetypal is you have to magnify the undeserved and you have to magnify the tragedy and so that's easy first of all you make the person who's submitted to the tragedy not only innocent in all possible ways but as good as anyone has ever been and then you make sure everyone knows that because there's no misapprehension as to that goodness. And then you make the death early, and then you make it brutal in the most brutal possible way. And then you make it brought about by tyrants as a consequence of betrayal, uh, pushed forward by someone who is relativistic in relationship to the truth at the hands of a mob that knew that the innocence was 
real and that chose a criminal instead to be redeemed. It's like, that's pretty bad. You know, that's pretty bad. That's kind of the sum total of all the horrors of life. But then that's not all, because in the cloud of mythology that surrounds Christianity, there is a notion that the figure of divinity that Christ represents is not only the voluntary confrontation and acceptance with the worst that individual life can possibly throw at you, but also the encounter with hell itself, because Christ harrows hell. And we talked a little bit earlier in the intro about um, totalitarian atrocity. And, you know, Nazi death camp or a gulag archipelago camp is pretty much a close enough analog to hell for me as something that would demonstrate the reality of something like hell, which is an evil that's so deep that it's transcendent in some real sense. And that's really what the Nuremberg judgments decided, uh, as we all know. And I would say that to face the totality of life does not only mean to face the reality of unjust suffering and the sacrifice of the innocent, but to encounter the very forces of hell themselves. And that that is the pathway to redemption. And that's a hell of a story. And I think, as far as I can tell, it's, and I don't know what this means in the final analysis, and neither does anyone else. As far as I can tell, it's just true. And I can close by saying, let's think it through for a minute. Like, imagine that you were going to maximally adapt to life. Well, how could you get away with avoiding any of it? Like, you have to, you have to go everywhere in some sense, and you have to do everything in some sense, and you have to accept everything about life because otherwise you're hiding away, right? You're not calling on yourself even to be forced to reveal what is within you that would allow you to prevail. And so that would mean in some sense that Christ is, speaking psychologically, the proper model for emulation because the proper model for emulation is the radical acceptance of the suffering that characterizes life and the hellish aspect that's a consequence of well human insufficiency and sin and that's on each of us and i think that is the central christian doctrine and i also think that's the foundation stone of western civilization and so i suppose all of that also makes me a very strange sort of conservative but still a conservative and so yeah, I'm detailing all of that and more, I would say, in my next book, by the way. And, uh, that's what I'd be working on now. And so that's probably not such a bad place to stop because that's a lot of information in a very short period of time. So I would like, again, to thank all of you in, in the deepest sense and, again, to express my regrets for not being able to be there in person. Um, I'm zipping about in many places in a very short period of time. And um, I'm glad we were able to do this and I'm glad that it worked. And uh, I appreciate, as I said, all the time and effort and the um, recognition, let's say, that this represents. And uh, that's, that's a good place to bring these remarks to a close. Thank you for joining us and thank you very much. And all best and good luck and uh, may you continue with your work. We need you. Well, I hope perhaps we can meet when I'm in the UK and I'm, I'll be in the UK for about a month uh, right away. I think I'm, I think I land there next week. And so we can make arrangements to, to conclude this properly in some manner in person. And that would be very good. So thank you all for, uh, for the signal honor, it's much appreciated. We're offline. Record.